Thank you, John, and good morning, all. Uh, I now have the distinct pleasure and honor of uh, introducing Jonathan Rose. Uh, this is also a challenge because uh, in introducing somebody so accomplished, one has to do justice uh, in conveying the breadth and scope of all of the accomplishments as much as you just have to be quick and get out of the way. So please bear with me. Um, Mr. Rose is the president and founder of Jonathan Rose Companies, uh, a multidisciplinary real estate development, planning, and consulting investment firm that is a leading provider in green urban solutions. Their core mission is to repair the fabric of communities. Uh, the firm's work touches on many aspects of community health, working with cities and not-for-profits to build not only housing, but also civic, cultural, uh, educational, and the infrastructure of open space. The firm cur currently manages over $1.5 billion of groundbreaking work. In 2005, for example, the firm launched the nation's first green transit or interacquisitions and uh, redevelopment fund. The firm's notable planning investment uh, uh, and new construction, conversion, and historic preservation development work, projects as stunning as uh, New York City's new Via Verde project, which you may have seen widely published recently, have won awards from many organizations, and I'm just going to skip, but basically take all of them. Um, Mr. Rose's business, uh, public policy and not-for-profit work, uh, all focus on creating more environmentally, socially, and economically responsible world. He is a thought leader in the smart growth, green building, and affordable housing movements, and a frequent speaker and writer. Uh, his work has re received widespread media attention at the New York Times, uh, CNN, and recently, and you should check it out, he was profiled in East Square, a PBS series on sustainable uh, development, which is really quite interesting. Uh, Mr. Rose is also trusting several organizations, and I'll just try to run through them very quickly, but I think that it's important that you uh, make the connections. The Urban Land Institute, where he was a founding co-chair on the Committee on Climate, Energy, and Land Use. The Natural uh, Resources Defense Council. He was the vice chair of Enterprise Community Partners, a very important organization. And he also serves on the Leadership Council of Yale University, both the Forestry School and the School of Architecture. So you can see here a broad-ranging kind of uh, scope of his in in involvement. Uh, as well as the Trust for Public Land. Uh, he also chaired the Metropolitan Transit Authority's Blue Ribbon Sustainability Commission, which developed uh, the nation's first green uh, transit plan. And that's very important, we'll go back to transit. So after hearing all of that, you would be tired of doing all of that. But Mr. Rose is also a co-founder of the Garrison Institute with his wife, Diana Rose. And there he leads a climate, mind, and behavior program the Institute is located in a beautiful old monastery on the Hudson. It's just across uh, West Point. And the Garrison Institute and its program initiatives work to apply the power of contemplation in practical, systematic ways to the key change fields of education, contemplative care, and ecology. So evidently, there's the source of all that boundless energy. Um, so wrapping up, let's just talk about local connections. Uh, after graduating from Yale University with a BA in psychology and philosophy, uh, uh, Jonathan Mr. Rose came to um, Penn here, and he received a Master of Regional Planning. So he has uh, known a lot of you from back then, and we're pleased that he's back in the city. Uh, a most recent Philadelphia connection is his company's development along with APM, or Asociación de Puerto Ricanos en Marcha. You have to be Puerto Rican, let me to roll your R's. Um, on Paseo Verde, which is a TOD project adjacent uh, Temple's uh, regional rail station. Uh, this is a project that is a state-of-the-art mixed-use housing project uh, that is targeting a LEED Gold certification for housing and a LEED ND Platinum uh, certification. That would be the, the city's first LEED ND project. That is also a project that I'm just thrilled to be taking part of, so let's also thank him for hiring local architects. So please give me a, a hand in joining Walt, Jonathan Rose. Thank you, Antonio, and we always hire local architects. We think it's very important. Okay, um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about planning for an uncertain future, because what I think we've all experienced in the last decade, and we're certainly gonna experience going forward, the, certain, the, the future is quite uncertain. So partly what I'm gonna do before I get into design, I, I'm gonna give you an overview of where I really think we are in the world. So this was the revolution that took place in Tunisia and in, in Egypt, and um, uh, it, was, it was quite unexpected. There was actually only one uh, 
part of data, global data that you could look at that indicated why this was going to happen. And it was an enormous simultaneous increase in GDP and in social disparity. So there was simultaneously a lot more wealth created in Tunisia and Egypt and Bahrain and the other places where the revolutions took place and a lot and, and more a larger percentage of society left out from that increase in wealth. So that's something very important that we need to understand, by the way. So in London two years ago, in the summer, there were riots. Who would have thought that London was going to break out into riots? Now this is an interesting map. The deeper the red in this map, the greater the degree of poverty. And, which, and, and those little uh, Google data points are where every place where a riot took place or destruction. And what you see is that they did not take place in the areas of the greatest poverty. They took place on the edges, the literal zones between the areas of greatest poverty and middle class, rising middle class. So they took place again on that zone of frustration between seeing incredible increased prosperity and not being able to participate in it. And so this is a really important theme for cities uh, uh, coming in the future. We globally have this enormous burst of materialism and prosperity at one end of the line and this incredible poverty people who are living in less than a dollar a day or two dollars a day, about two billion people at the other end, and an ever-increasing chasm. Where the world is increasingly globalized, so this is a map, every uh, area on the left, so those are all different continents. So the top is Europe, the blue is Europe, the next one is Asia, the next one is, um, the, low, the light blue below is the North America. And each line shows what they sell to another continent. So you'll see, for example, take the blue, Europe. So the part that goes from the left to the right means it's like they're selling a Mercedes from Germany to France. But when a line goes to one of the other places, then they're selling you know, a Peugeot to China. Um, and what you're seeing is that our economies are increasingly interwoven. And one of, that, one of that, the implications of that is that no country or city can determine its fate entirely alone. It's part of a much more complicated web. So globally, in 2007, the top 600 cities in the world had 1.5 billion people in them. They had $30 trillion of GDP and 4.5 million uh, middle class. By 2025, that is not so far away. That population is going to increase. The GDP in cities around the world is going to double, and the middle class is just going to about to double. So the opportunities in, in economic development are tremendously in the cities. But the reality is which cities are going to be in the top 600 are going to dramatically change. They're going to shift from the developed world to the developing world. The United States currently has 190 cities in the top 600, and that number is going to drop to 125. So that means that 70, 65 of our cities are going to fall off the global map of importance. I don't know which ones those are. Uh, and we're competing with places, cities like Casablanca, uh, which I always thought was a great place for a film, is going to be a great, is, is actually a growing part of the world's economy. Uh, oh, so I'm sorry, let's go just go back. And the developed world is only going to have 34, is going to move from 73%, their city, 73% of the world's economy to 34%. So there's a very rapid shift and it's happening now. We also have a tremendous climate uncertainty. So this is a dust storm that took place in Phoenix recently. This is the, what they call the snow apocalypse that happened in Chicago that completely froze the roads. This is in, in Atlanta a couple years ago. They had a drought. They went down to about 56 days of water, and they, the reservoirs were just about dry, and they had no solutions. And this is taking place all over the world, which is creating dramatic increases in migration. There will be 150 million people that in the next probably 10 or 15 years due to rising sea level who will have to move. Bangladesh uh, the, uh, is going to be substantially underwater, and India is building a wall now to prevent the Bangladeshis from going into India. Um, we're going to have, a, 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 when it rains, uh, as we've seen recently, we're going to get um, uh, much more intense rain, much more, uh, some cities are going to have the same amount of rain, but it'll fall more rapidly and in more intense periods, uh, flooding our water and sewer systems, our, our combined sewer systems. This is uh, lower Manhattan, and here we see the New York Harbor 
if there's a three meter sea level rise, everything that is blue is underwater, not underwater during storm surge, which is much worse, but just underwater. And here's what happens with a five meter sea level rise. And here's what actually happened uh, during Hurricane Sandy. Now this is really interesting because uh, first of all, if you look at the lower left, Battery Park City is all lit up. So somehow it had an independent power system and it did fine. The whole rest of lower Manhattan is out, except for that one building that's lit. If you look, you see little bits of lights that come from emergency generators, and then you see how the rest of the city is thriving. This really calls upon us to think about, you know, our cities live on infrastructure. You, many of you, I understand that this region was not hit, but many of you may have houses on the Jersey Shore, certainly know people who are up there, and you look at what happened when the power went out. And if the power goes out for a year, what happens to civilization? If the power goes out for five years, what happens to civilization? We live, actually, the, the, the nature, the prosperity, the quality of the world that we live in today is extraordinarily dependent, at the densities that we live, is extraordinarily dependent upon infrastructure systems. And these systems are too fragile, and they are not designed to accommodate the complexity is coming ahead. So actually we have an economic system that is not designed for that enormous social disparity that I've showed you that is coming and that I view as a threat to the healthy functioning of society. And we have the same thing, our physical infrastructures are not designed for the climate threats that are coming. The military has a phrase for this. It's called VUCA. And they say that the world is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This phrase came up in the late 1990s. So volatile, I've just shown you that the, there's economic volatility, there's climate volatility, there's a globalization. We're, we're much more connected, but uh, and, you know, look at your own firms and probably what your employment levels were in 2006 and 7 and what your employment levels were in 2009 and 10, and you've experienced economic volatility. The, um, but we have multiple volatilities, and what those mean is we're uncertain. By the way, one of the things, again, that's happening in employment, particularly in design firms, is we are, instead of hiring enthusiastically, we're very cautiously making the next hire. So we're working at a higher stress level because we're just not quite confident enough to overhire again. Um, so that sense of uns so we live in a world that's uncertainty that comes from the volatility because we can't really predict where things are going. There are two ways to think about the world. One is complex and one is, is um, complicated. So for example, think of the New York City or any water supply, typical older city water supply system. You have a reservoir, you have main aqueducts that take it to the central city, a whole bunch of pipes, a whole bunch of valves, millions of valves, millions of pipes, miles and miles. It's a very complicated system, but it's not complex. Complex systems, all the parts are interdependent. They're all interconnected. And so that in a complicated system, you can affect one part and you completely know what's gonna happen. You can turn off a main valve or you have a water break and you know everything downstream from that's not gonna get water. Very simple, in a way. In a complex system, you can't predict the outcome because there's so many interconnecting parts. Our economy is that way, the climate system is that way. Uh, urban systems, cities function that way that the outcomes are much more uncertain in complexity, and so the whole system is much more ambiguous, and that is the world that we're functioning in. That's the world that we have to make design decisions within, and we need to design solutions that are much more adaptable in this kind of a world. So our own, the way we think about design and the way we design projects has to actually change if those buildings are going to live successfully in this kind of a world. OK, so I'm going to get onto pictures, because I know architects really like pictures after this. But this is, so there's been a lot of questions about how do you design cities to be more resilient to things like the storms that we've been seeing, the economic shocks we've been seeing. So I want you to think about uh, uh, urban systems in the following way. There are hard systems and soft systems. So a hard system is a physical system, like the subway system, the, the water system, the sewer system. The soft system is the management system for how it manages, how it operates. 
And what we have seen is that when the power goes out, very often the soft systems die and the, and the hard system goes dead. Soft systems also include governance. So for example, we saw after Hurricane Katrina, the whole system totally fell apart. The police didn't show up. The school system failed. The hospitals got emptied. The, the mayor didn't control. So governance is extremely important. We have active systems and passive systems. So I, for example, described to you water supply system with a gra gravity fed. That's essentially passive. It continues to run even when the power goes down. Active systems um, are energized, so they're without a source of energy, they're at risk. I talked to you about complicated and complex, central and distributed. So again, we have, a, we'll get to that in a minute, about power supply in Philadelphia, and human systems and natural systems. Okay, infrastructure. Does anybody know what this is? This is the train station in um, uh, Detroit. Uh, this is the state of much of America's infrastructure. The uh, Society of Engineers gives our, they go through each system and essentially our average grade is a D. So in Washington today, there's a fiscal cliff, discussions are going on and they're missing something very important. They're discussing revenues, and they're discussing expenses, but they're not discussing investments. We need to invest in America. We need to invest in rebuilding our cities. We need to invest in rebuilding our infrastructure. There's a $2 trillion infrastructure deficit. We talk about the national deficit. We don't talk about the infrastructure deficit. The whole future of our prosperity, of our, the potential opportunity for better social equality, the opportunity for better climate resilience, opportunity to compete better globally, globally, all the things I mentioned earlier are dependent upon a healthier infrastructure. So it's something that I hope that AIA National will be advocating for. It's something that we all need to really pay attention to. If there's not adequate infrastructure investment, everything else we're doing does not succeed. There's, an, um, a, there's some incredible infrastructure. This is the, happens to be the MTA system, so a whole train system outside that serves New York City. But you'll see there's a lot of spaces in between. We need to think about our infrastructure in multiple levels. So this is a hard system. Remember I described hard systems, soft systems. But what's missing is we need a whole minibus system. You know, so we, people are very dependent upon the single uh, occupant automobile. We need a whole minibus system. We need streetcar system. We need extenders. We need to take our existing infrastructure, invest in it, and figure out how to extend in it. There's a whole movement about um, you know, zip, zip car is one piece that is moving from ownership to rentership in housing. So we're seeing a dramatic movement from people wanting to own single family houses, townhouses, and condominiums towards renting. Very sad. More and more people, both at the uh, below 30 age and at the retiring age or the baby boomer uh, as kids move out of the house phase being very comfortable now renting. It's something that they were less interested in a decade ago, but also comfortable not owning their own car. Very happy to have a zip car or other car share program right around the corner that gives you cars when you need them and no responsibility when you don't need them. And we're going to be seeing that shared consumption happening more and more, I believe, and it's more, much more um, environmentally and economically efficient. I talked about the water supply system. Uh, we're seeing the emergence of smart systems to manage cities. This is the uh, IBM General Operations and Intelligence Center in Rio, uh, where we begin to integrate the intelligence of all of our, so this is what's very interesting, is if you want to create better safety, better environmental efficiency, et cetera, what you're seeing around the world is this increase in uh, the application of intelligence of sensors everywhere, and combining something called big data that are being used to manage cities. So for example, they've started in San Francisco to put uh, uh, sensors under every parking space in the street. Have you guys heard about this? So what it means is that you'll be able to get into your car and say, I'm going to such and such a place, I want to reserve a space, or I want to see what's available. And maybe you'll say, I'm going to pay $10 an hour for reserve space, or I'm going to pay 25 cents an hour, but I'm going to take a risk. But while I'm driving, I'm going to monitor and see what's nearby. Maybe I can program into my computer, show me the parking space that is closest to where I want to go, or show me the parking space that's cheapest to where I need to go. And all that can be auctioned and managed, which will now. One of the reasons why is 30% of all gasoline used in cities is used looking for a parking space. 
So if you can eliminate that, think of the environmental benefits. Cities currently undervalue their street parking space, actually. So cities will get much more revenue. Because of the more revenue, people are going to shift more to mass transit. It'll have all kinds of positive benefits that come with intelligence. But also what happens is when the power goes out, the system goes dead. So what we need to do is simultaneously build up this complex urban management system, but also understand what do you do when the, when the system goes dead. And maybe what the system needs is also those old dumb meters where you had to put a quarter in uh, also. Um, so this, by the way, is one of the things that happens. This is a guy, so power goes out, and, and it's a policeman who's all of a sudden become the stoplight. Okay, so Philadelphia. Does anybody know how many, I, try, I was trying to find out how many power plants feed Philadelphia. Does anybody know? So I could find out your sources. So here your, your power comes 55% from coal, 35% from nuclear, um, uh, 5 from gas, 2 from oil, and the rest. So very little um, renewable sources, very, very uh, coal and nuclear dependent. The, uh, one of the things we're learning is that when a power plant goes out, then it has a major negative impact to a system. And so the, the dis more distributed we can be in things like power, so if you had, let's just say you're fed by eight plants, if you could be fed by 25 plants, then the ratio of impact, of negative impact from any one plant is better. So distributed systems in a volatile complex world are better systems. The, uh, this is a plan that was done by ARO in a, there was an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art called uh, Rising Waters, Rising Currents. And one of the things I mentioned earlier in that earlier list, there was a human systems versus natural systems. One of the big lessons from Hurricane Katrina was that they got rid of, the, they had destroyed all the wetlands and the wetlands are a natural absorber. It's, evolution has designed wetlands over millions of years to absorb storms, to be the interface between water and the land. Um, and we have, none of our cities, our cities all have hard edges when they actually need soft edges. And so one of the questions is, and I'm gonna to get to this in a minute, but Philadelphia is the leader in the country in looking at how we use soft systems to deal with water. And so what we need to do is extend that idea to not only our stormwater on source management, but maybe we need to bring it to uh, the, the edge our land edge. It does not going to, by the way, when sea level rises three feet, it's going to rise three feet. This isn't going to stop it. But the storm surge part, it'll, it can be a significant mitigator of it. This is a, um, a side view of a project that's it's hard to see. This is just the courtyard level. Actually, the buildings go up like 30 stories tall. Uh, a proposal that we did for a project in New York City that we didn't win, but it was near a waterfront. And we, unlike any, we were the only developers that in our proposal said, Sea level is going to rise. Storm surge is going to increase. So what you want to do in that circumstance is you want to raise your building up. In this case, uh, we raised it up about uh, eight feet. But what urban design tells you is that's a terrible thing to do from the street because what you get at the street is just dead walls for eight feet if you've raised a building up. So how do you mediate this difference? So if the far left of the building is the street. So if you look at then what happens, we have a, a, a plaza outside that is actually a soft edge with trees, et cetera. And then really what we're doing is we're working way up. So the, to the right is the eight foot higher. So if you look at the, there's a mother and child there and you can see she's about six feet tall and add another two feet and you can see how the plaza to the right is really eight feet higher. But we step it up in a series of green plazas, little water fountain, et cetera, so that you, when you're walking down the street, you're getting a soft edge that is taking you to the higher level. So I believe, and by the way, that's also uh, a, a good storm surge breaker upper, you know, if there's, but, but the key is that we're gonna have to think about how we design our cities to higher level, elevation levels if we're anywhere near water. But we're gonna have to do it, the big challenge is to do it in an urban design way that works while life is lower. I mean, there's another plan that we've been thinking about which is how do you design a lobby for a building when you know that perhaps three years later, the, or I'm sorry, 30 years from now, that lobby needs to be two feet higher. So for example, when we set all of our elevator door box, should we be 
building in the space above, you know, set the lintel two feet higher so that the box could over time be raised up so that you can actually, so I, you're gonna need to begin to think when you're designing in, in, in flood sensitive areas, how you're gonna adapt to future conditions has to be built into the design of buildings now. Philadelphia is doing a great job, and I know the AAIA has been an important component of thinking this through, of really how do we design systems that absorb more water in a natural way. Um, so I wanna show you some of our projects and show you how we have been responding to some of these questions. Our company does four things. In the upper right, we do development projects. We also do urban planning. We just finished a master plan for the city of Newark. We're master planners for uh, Morristown, New Jersey. We do a lot of planning that looks at environmental issues, affordable housing, and how we create economic development, particularly for low-income people. We do project management, and the lower left is a picture of uh, the new Cooper Union Building, which we, it's one of the many kinds of projects that we oversee. So we oversee a lot of cultural facilities, uh, university buildings, et cetera, and we have the country's first green real estate investment fund. I'm gonna show you uh, a, a couple projects that we built in the um, South Bronx and Northern uh, Manhattan area. So this one is called um, Joyce and David Dinkins Gardens. It was designed by uh, Richard Dattner's firm, and it was the first green affordable housing project in Harlem. I want to just call out a couple features so you'll see there's a lot of sunshades. So the key to this is integrated design. So I want to give you an example for us of what integrated design means. Because we do so much affordable housing, we work in a realm in which there's not an additional dollar to go green, and yet our projects are very, very green. So for example, in this case, we put a gas-fired boiler on the roof. Boilers used to be in basements because people used to shovel coal, and you want to shovel coal down not, down, not up. There's no reason for a boiler to be in a basement. In fact, you can save the cost of the basement by putting it on the roof. But also, when a boiler's on the roof, it runs 3% more efficient because it does not have to heat and push the flue gases up through the flue. When you eliminate the flue, you save $10,000 a floor. And in, nine-story building or 11-story building, you save $110,000. When you eliminate the flu, you can take a closet and turn it into a walk-in closet. So here's what happens. It's a green strategy that gives you lower operating costs, lower capital costs, and higher net to gross ratio. That's the way you have to think with every green strategy you're doing because your clients are coming to you all and saying, we don't have the budget for indulgence. In this case, what we did then is we took the savings that came from putting the boilers on the roof and we used it to add these sunshades. So now my tenants are paying for their own electricity. These are low income, this house, a third of this is housing for youth aging out of foster care. Uh, the rest are very low income families. They can't afford high utility bills. And so by creating the sun shading, which is a passive system, we reduce the heat gain in the summer, we also gave them ceiling fans so they don't have to use air conditioning. They have air conditioning, but they don't have to use it. So they can shift their own behavior and manage their energy costs down. So it's a, in a zero cost system, I reduced my operating costs and their operating costs. That's really the key to green, green design thinking. Uh, with this project also has a community gardens. Uh, one of the other things, you see the two kind of sitting chairs and these rocks. We really believe that in the high stress urban environment that people need contemplative spaces. We need places that we can sit and meditate places that we can disconnect, places that maybe don't have internet access, where we can really more deeply kind of immerse ourselves in our own human experience. Uh, green roof for absorbing stormwater, it's also beautiful, and then uh, solar power. Now one of the interesting things about solar power that uh, typically the solar power on our projects is sized just to handle the core and shell. So again, remember I was talking about resilience in terms of heavy climate impacts and climate events. Uh, what's been difficult, because Con Ed doesn't let you do it, but we have to figure, we're gonna have to figure out how to solve this, is so if I have enough solar to run the elevator, and I could add batteries to them or have them feed into a generator system, to run the elevators, some emergency lighting, and my boilers and pumps, then my building is doing okay when the climate comes out. My, Tenants may be having to eat by candlelight, and you know it's not the perfect circumstance, but it's a survivable circumstance. Um, Alex Wilson of Environmental Building News wrote a fantastic article about passive survivability, which I all recommend that you read to think about these issues. So Olson Dinkins Gardens, we created a, a uh, heat recycling system. So what happens is 
Um, the, the building's built of concrete blank and plank and block, and we turn the planks so that the hollows in the plank, the voids, go to the outside. So um, in this case, and we have little trickle vents above the windows, so fresh air comes in through the trickle vents. Uh, it is exhausted not through ducts through the whole building, but it's exhausted from kitchens and baths by little fans back into the plank as it goes through the plank to go back out. It, the plank absorbs the heat in it and re-radiates it, so you get passive heat re-radiation or recycling. In the summer, the plank, by the way, naturally as the thermal mass cools the space, um, but you get a complete fresh air cycle within every apartment so that every, if somebody's smoking in one and somebody's not in another, each apartment is completely independently sealed. It also means you don't get rodents going from apartment to apartment. And again, this saved us the cost of ducts. This saves us the cost of running, um, you know, roof fans 24 hours a day. It's a pro-environmental solution using a natural attribute of an existing material that is saving us money. Uh, that's the plank. Uh, is to, we also capture rainwater in the project, which we use with high-efficiency boilers. We use the rainwater for the gardens. I told you there's youth aging out of foster scare. We actually have a, a construction trade school for the kids. Uh, I say we, we built this project with a partner, Harlem RBI, and they own and run the project. This is uh, Via Verde, which is in the South Bronx. And uh, this was a, a response to a question, what is the uh, future of affordable housing? So on the left, it, it's a tall north-south site. And so we put, it's a north-south site, so we put the tallest part of the building on the north and the lowest part on the south so that you have great solar access. It's a thin site. We actually thin the building down to be a single loaded corridor, you'll see, or a, a double loaded corridor, but very thin building. I'll show you how that works. So we get much more cross ventilation. And it's a mixture of low income rental and moderate and middle income home ownership. So we really believe in mixed income communities. Uh, and you see there's a series of solar panels uh, vertically, horizontally across the roof, and you'll see more too. So remember, I've been talking a lot about passive survivability. So one of the things we did is we moved the stairwell, so that tall vertical section is a stairwell, to the outside of the building. Normally, they're in the inside. And we day lit them so that, number one, to encourage people to walk more for exercise, but number two, to make them more usable when the power goes down. Uh, this is a view of, from the south side. You see the entire south side is covered with solar. And as I said, it's enough solar to run all the core and shell operating systems. Um, the sun shading. So you saw at Dinkins Gardens our first sun shading system as our, that, that work is probably eight years old now, something like that. So our facades are getting more and more complex. This is a rain streak facade. But you can see here how the sun shading is actually working across the facade of the building. Um, this is the interior of the project. So you see, still see sun shading on the right. But you begin to see a courtyard system. And when you come in the ground floor, so we really believe in highly engaged social systems. And in places like the South Bronx, they need to be, you need a whole public park system, but you also need a secure interior system. Uh, there's a children's playground you'll see in a minute in the foreground, and then you'll see these steps going up, which are actually an amphitheater too, so it's a community gathering space. Above that, an orchard, and then community gardens, and it leads into a health area. So here we are looking down. Uh, this is the children's play area. And then you saw in the background, you saw the amphitheater rising up, uh, which will be programmed by the residents. And here we are in the orchard. And then here we are in the community gardens, uh, uh, which will grow not enough food for everybody in the project, but a substantial amount of food. And then as we go up to the left, there's a uh, then more contemplative garden with a yoga area, a reading area, a meditation area. And that opens onto a health club. Now, normally, in a low-income building, the health club would be put in the community facilities would be put in the basement. But here, we're not getting any more rent for the high areas, so we, we really believe those are great places to share with the residents. And, and they actually, they go, the, the main community room is on the very top floor overlooking all the Bronx. So here's some of the gardening. It's a, looking down from the project. I mentioned that we really focused on cross-ventilation. And so uh, here we are. We have a skip-stop floor system. So you enter on the ground floor. So to, what you see to the left is living room, dining room, kitchen. Then you go upstairs. And then, so these are duplexes, and then you have two bedrooms on either side, so you get cross ventilation. And these units interlock. I don't know if that's clear, so one next to the other. So you're getting cross ventilation. So here we are on the ground floor of the unit. Uh, so 
That's, uh, and, and then it goes up to a duplex. A lot of green features in that building. The last project I want to show you is the one that we're doing with Antonio's firm, WRT. We're a wonderful firm and wonderful projects. Uh, so this is in North Philly, right next to the North Philly train station, right next to Temple University. Temple University is in a fantastic engine for uh, really taking the um, a great deal, a large percentage of, of the Philadelphia region population and providing the kind of education that, that uh, is preparing them for the jobs of the future. Uh, so this is a view of the project. It's a long site uh, and uh, um, uh, very horizontal. And so we broke it up with a whole series of courtyards. You'll see some more so that it's not a, a, not a monolithic site. The train station is literally to the left of the project, created a tower on the corner. It's got retail on the ground floor. So the program is a mixture. Just, uh, just the way Via Verde, as I said, had both low-income rental and middle-income co-ops. This has low-income rental on one portion. It has market rate rental on about 50-50 uh, on, on the other half of it. And then it has um, office space, particularly for our partner. Very, very important that we're, this is a, a true partnership with um, APM, a local community development organization. And they're going to move their offices there. We're very pleased about that. Also, in we're seeing more and more of our projects that we're bringing that health is very important. So in this case, um, we have a community health center uh, on the ground floor as our tenant. Also in Via Verde, we have uh, a branch of Montefiore Hospital on the ground floor as a tenant. And we also have, uh, we believe we're very close to leasing a pharmacy here, which we also have at Via Verde. So we're seeing providing community health facilities in the retail space very important in lower income and transitional communities. Um, this is just a, a more detailed scheme that gives you a sense of some of the green features. Uh, the solar, the courtyards, the, the, we spend an enormous amount of time on insulation and, and the skin. We hope when you see this project, you're like the skin. We have spent more time on the skin than, we spent a lot of time on the skin trying to, to get it right. These are some of those interior, so there's interior courtyards that I had mentioned to you. Uh, and I think I'm going to skip this. This is a project, the Cooper Union project that we were the project. Yeah, I'm going to skip this. Because what I love to do is move to questions. So thank you. Yes. How do you retrofit a city? OK, you got to ret retrofit a city at multiple levels. You have to retrofit the buildings. America, in a good year, builds 1% of its building stock. And typically, like now, in a more recessionary time, we build, a, build about a third of our building stock. So and uh, I didn't have them in this presentation, but we have a whole practice in our company of greening existing buildings. So number one, we need to retrofit our existing buildings. Number two, we need to think more about at a neighborhood scale. So what you've seen is that actually cities, uh, so that means, for example, you've heard about food deserts. We need to distribute food resources. We kind of need to think about how do you make um, uh, enough resources, excellence in education, et cetera, all accessible in a relatively walking or easy transit distance within cities. So it's very much about neighborhood development. And then the issue is infrastructure. And the biggest issue with infrastructure is that we're, we're, most of our cities are living off of what can, most of our East Coast cities can be a 100-year-old infrastructure. Um, we have to really rethink infrastructure, and yet we simply cannot afford to replace it all at once. So one of the things we're going to need to think about is, and, and by the way, if you just think about the environmental impact statement to replace a major infrastructure system, that could be. It could, from first thought to final implementation, we're talking about probably 40 years in infrastructure. So we need to get to planning it now. And we need to, the reason I showed you so many slides of volatility up front is because I'm trying to get it into your minds that the, we have to start planning for that today to adapt to the world we're going to be living in in 40 years from now. And it's going to take a long time. And that means things like, remember I mentioned the elevators being able to move up. We're going to need to be able to adjust heights on things like perhaps bridges. or We, we need to, that's going to, has to be part of our design uh, thinking. The, I talked about hard systems and soft systems. So we're going to have to think more about how you design operating systems that are flexible under a wider range of circumstances. 
It's a big task. It's an exciting task. It's a full employment task for you guys if you get it right. And, um, and what we really need is the funding to fund the, all this work. Yes. Um, so we use several tools for benchmark. The question is, how do we benchmark the greening of our buildings? I really believe in third-party verification because um, it's really easy to say you're green, but you got to prove it every day. So we use several systems for our. Um, there is. I'm sorry. There are some points I'm going to show you about this building. But for our uh, um, institutional work, when we're doing schools, uh, uh, office buildings, etc., we always use LEED. We always use Energy Star. We are working um, with a national, uh, um, Paul, what's the, Bright Power. We're working with a company called Bright Power to actually we, uh, do benchmarking of each one of our buildings. So we're, uh, and many of our buildings, by the way, we're putting in feedback devices so all the residents can go online and look at websites because that's a whole, behavior shift is a whole part of benchmarking. And then for multifamily, we have used LEED and do often use LEED, but the reality is LEED's very expensive, and the best system we find for multifamily is the Enterprise Green Communities system, the guideline system. And Enterprise Green Communities is, is less expensive to implement and more focused than LEED on human health. So we think it's more appropriate for multifamily housing, um, although, as I said, we do use both. One of the things I really admire about the USGBC is that the LEED system is continually being improved. And I'm sure we all have criticisms about one thing we think that's misallocated about points or that you could have gotten a, you know, lead platinum five years ago and how it doesn't compare to lead gold today or whatever. But the system, it's a system of continuous feedback and improvement. And so I strongly recommend if you have concerns about it, pass them on to them. But it's, it's a system we need to support in its growth. Okay, since I don't see any other questions, I'm gonna show you two other slides that I wanted to show you, but I forgot. Okay, so this building, this Cooper Union building designed by Morphosis, um, and one of the key things that we decided to do was um, Cooper Union is an urban school. It has very little, really no public realm, and so we created this amazing stair system inside, which is an architectural feature, but it is also a smoke exhaust system. It's a system that brings daylight inside, it is a social system. The stairs were absolutely designed for this kind of behavior, for people to be sitting on them. And it created the kind of missing public realm to Cooper. And by the way, it improved the building's net to gross ratio. And remember, that I'm creating a lot of volume, but not using up a lot of FAR, which was a very effective thing. Uh, we put in a skip-stop elevator system, so we're trying to encourage people to walk. Now, there's a freight elevator and handicapped elevator for those who need it, but you can see the blue dot, the uh, pink dots are where the elevator stops, so essentially floors one, five, and eight when you're going up. And then there's this interior stair system which encourages people to walk, so we're trying to increase force, not force, encourage, shift behavior to create more increased social ability and more exercise then uh, through the way the actual elevator, and then you gotta make the stairs beautiful enough and social enough that actually people would rather be in the stairs than the elevator. So we, I do a lot of thinking, uh, and Antonio mentioned about behavior, mentioned in my introduction, something called climate mind and behavior. You're all welcome to Google it. Because we're really, the Garrison Institute's thinking about taking, how we take the lessons of cognitive and neuroscience, connect them with social science, and shift people's behavior to be greener and happier. I want to, just two other points. So this is the floor plan of that building, and essentially we came up with a schema in which the back of the building, which is everything on the top side of the plan, <clears throat> are labs, and they're all stacked over each other. It makes it very efficient for exhaust, et cetera, to have those services. And the front side of the building are all offices. Um, and so, again, it's a different kind of, you can stack those. So when we were designing the building, the building's coming in over budget, and we did something that I have found that most of you hate, and that is we did a peer review. And what we discovered was the client said, as clients always do, design a building for the future, design a building with maximum flexibility, a very good thing for a client to say. But the result was that the, when it got down to the structural engineer, the structural engineer said, well, maximum flexibility, we will design it to be able to put a lab anywhere. So the labs have a much higher floor load and much higher fire suppression, et cetera. So that was all put on the front side, too, where the offices were. We, as a client, didn't know that. 
We just knew our structural price was high. When we did a peer review on the structure, it was the peer reviewer said, do you know that you're designing your offices to 200 pounds a square foot and I could take a million dollars of steel out of the building? I say this because when we propose peer review to, our, to the architects we're hiring, I get a lot of pushback. What I implore you to think about is that your clients don't really understand everything you're doing. And in some cases, I've now been running this more and more, even sometimes you don't know exactly what your structural engineer or mechanical engineer is really doing in the systems of the buildings. That a peer review at all levels is actually an incredibly elucidating process. It's really, you should view it as a part of a, of a, a how can you co-evolve the design process to make a building better. Um, and in this case, uh, so this is just one example, and I'm sure each one of you have an example uh, in your own work. There's another interesting thing that we did in this building, and that is the client said to us, you, have a, you are only allowed to design for three light bulbs. I am not going to stock any more than three light bulbs. You pick them, you only got three. That includes the auditorium, the stage lighting, whatever you want, you got three light bulbs. And it was a really hard and interesting and effective discipline, which I highly encourage you to do. I'm gonna end with this slide, which is my own office. And we picked these beautiful Italian light fixtures. It turns out it's impossible to change the light bulbs in them. And, <laughs> and, uh, and there's no American equivalent, and there's no American equivalent to the transformer or anything. And um, we didn't know. So one by one, over the years, the light bulbs have been burning out in our office, and we just had to completely replace. This is the guy, actually, yesterday, I took this just for you, of the guy changing the guts. So there's three light bulbs. So I just want to modify the three light bulb theory and say three American light bulbs. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, the question was, we really need mass transit. A lot of towns understand that now, but where's the funding? Well, <laughs> there's only, it, it, in my world, there's three kinds of funding. There's equity, grants, and debt. And, um, and there's all kinds of complicated ways to get there. You can have tax credits, and you can have tax exempt bonds and all that. But in the end, that's the bottom line. It is my view that our cities are just extraordinarily overstressed financially and do not have the capacity to be investing in significant transit systems. But what we are seeing around the country is that cities are taxing themselves and using versions of tax increment financing. So for example, in 2010, the year that supposedly the Tea Party took over in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma is the state that has Imhoff and Coburn, the two most anti-climate and conservative Congress people, uh, senators in the Senate. They voted to tax themselves $770 million to build a light rail system, a park system, and make downtown more walkable. So that is one thing that communities are doing piece by piece. We've seen the Denver metropolitan region, which is now building the largest transit system, new transit system in America, and they did it through getting 50, uh, towns and counties together in the Denver metro area to agree to a tax increase to pay for a transit system. Now that system, the Oklahoma City, is, um, is entirely self-funded. The Denver system is matched by federal funds. And it is absolutely essential that in the budget we have a, more, uh, a much more robust water, sewer, transit, and electric grid. Uh, and I actually think uh, internet data grid uh, financing. Some of it can be credit enhancing so that cities can borrow more cheaply, but a lot of it just needs to be a grant program. And it's just, you know, you, I'm going to make a political statement. We spent over a trillion dollars on two wars in, in the Middle East. I believe we would have been better if we'd spent that trillion dollars on America's infrastructure. One last question. Oh, I guess we're done. <laughs> Thank you very much.